Okay, um, so it is four after. Um, I want to respect everyone's time and you know stick to our hour. So again, thank you all so much for being here. Um, you will see here on screen our lovely panelists. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I just want to say thank you all so much for being here. Um, my name is Christina Clark O'Karmus. I'm the executive director at the Alabama Campaign for Adolescent Sexual Health. Um, we are a nonprofit in Alabama working to advance comprehensive sex ed. And of course, in December, um, there are many observances, um, World, World AIDS Day, um, HIV Testing Day. And so we wanted our focus to be on HIV, um, particularly in the South, because we seem to have some unique challenges and struggles in the South um, with uh, high HIV rates. And so that's why I have this invited this panel of experts today. Um, these are all folks that work in the South on the issue of HIV, so I'm so excited to have them all. Um, I am going to go ahead and ask our first question. Um, so first, could you all, all our panelists, introduce yourselves and tell us how you're connected to or involved with HIV work? And um, I'm gonna start with Tony and then we'll just go from there. Of course you will. Um, <laughs> my, <laughs> my name is Tony Kristen Walker. Uh, I, my pronouns are he, him, his. I am a lifetime resident of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I have been doing HIV work for the last nine years. I've been living with HIV since I was 26. I'm now 55, so I think I got a little bit of knowledge on that. I currently work for an organization called Jobs to Move America, and I also do HIV consulting work for Family Clinic in Birmingham. Thanks, Tony. Um, Christina, you any of our other panelists can popcorn around. I'll do it. I'll give it to Lori since I don't know her. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> My name is Lori Bishop. I am located in upstate South Carolina. I'm the HIV Prevention Program Coordinator for Piedmont Care, and we are a community-based organization providing case management to folks living with HIV and AIDS and also um, HIV prevention services. In addition, we do have a medical practice, um, very, I don't want to say fledgling, we're almost two years old now, the medical practice is almost two, so um, we provide um, medical care for folks living with HIV and AIDS, and I have been working as the prevention program coordinator for about six and a half years now, um, and I think that's all I have. Oh, pronouns are she and hers. And I'm going to follow suit like Tony did. I'm going to pass it to, <laughs> how about Chance? Joe, my name is Chance Shaw. I am, or my pronouns are they or he. I am the Ending the HIV Epidemic Coordinator for AIDS Alabama South in Mobile, Alabama. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Mobile. Um, I've been working in HIV for about three years now um, in the prevention capacity, and I've been community organizing for about seven now. Um, I'm going to follow suit, and I'm going to pass it over to Brittany. Hey, everybody. I'm Brittany Brooks. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I've been working in HIV, sexual reproductive health for about 10 years now. That's actually how I met Christina. Um, right now, I do have a consulting firm, and I work with several organizations across the state. Some are not in the state of Alabama, and I work on their different sexual health, reproductive health, HIV projects and campaigns, and I'm also um, adjunct faculty. And I'll pass it to Vanessa. Thanks, Brittany. Hey, y'all. My name is Vanessa Tate Finney. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at AIDS Alabama in Birmingham. So Chance and I work for the same organization, the same agency, but he's in Mobile and I'm in Birmingham. Um, one of the things that I focus on is policy work and uh, advocacy work in term community involved in HIV AIDS awareness. And, <clears throat> and uh, we typically do a, an awareness day, an advocacy day uh, around the, the, um, 
the, uh, sorry, <laughs> lost my words there for a second, uh, typically do an advocacy day around a legislative session, um, which is in the spring. And for anyone who's interested in getting more involved with HIV advocacy work, please feel free to reach out to Christina, to myself, or really anyone on this panel, and we can get you linked up into that activity. So um, very happy to be here today, and I'll pass it back to Christina. Awesome. Thank you all so much again for being here. I think we have a wealth of knowledge and experience in the room. Um, so this is a question for anyone. Everyone can answer it. Um, but as Southerners, why do you feel that we have higher rates of HIV? So um, another way of asking that is, what are our unique challenges here in the South that are leading to these high rates of HIV? So anyone can answer that. Multiple people can. I'll go ahead and start us off. Um, I think one of the reasons we face so many uh, challenges in the South when it comes to HIV has a lot to do with policy. Um, originally, uh, when, when HIV and AIDS became a big uh, policy issue was in the 80s when we first discovered HIV and AIDS. And as we started to address that issue, um, we really only started addressing it in the major metropolitan areas that were uh, that had HIV rate had high HIV rates. So places like San Francisco, New York City, um, the state of New York. Um, there were really that's where the focus was, and so the South went unattended for a very very long time, um, and we didn't actually start rectifying these issues until about 2010. So we've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, unfortunately, the South is home to about 50. It's well home to the absolute highest rates of um, prevalence, incidence, and deaths related to HIV and AIDS. And we're not seeing the same sort of rates and the same sort of death rates, especially in those major metropolitan areas that had that attention early on in the epidemic. So I, I think policy really has quite a bit to do with, um, with the situation we're in in the South now. And Vanessa, can you, you said prevalence, incidence, and deaths. Obviously, I know what deaths are, but can you explain to us the difference between prevalence and incidence? Or can sure. Someone... Sure. So incidence uh, refers to the number of cases we have currently, and prevalence is going to refer to the number of new diagnoses that we have. So the South is home to the highest rates, no matter how you look at um, what, where those rates come from, whether it's diagnoses, current uh, cases, or death rates, all of those are going to be the highest in the South. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that, um, for that okay. kind of history. Um, sorry, I'm realizing my picture is frozen. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. <laughs> <Good. laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go next. Great. So the South is home to a lot of things. So like one of the other things, two of the other things that, um, hinder HIV care in the South is um, stigma, uh, which takes a lot of different forms in a lot of different ways, um, toxic religion and institutional racism. So like stigma first, stigma around HIV is so bad to where like in order to take an HIV test, like those of us who have done testing, you have to like give an extra layer of consent to take an HIV test, which is just crazy. Uh, in my time in working in HIV, uh, I can think of like three major cases in which I had people who were like almost dying. Like they had been in care for like a year or so. And these were all men who did not fit the typical description of what we think HIV patients are. Um, one guy was, had gotten so sick, he had a trach trach where he couldn't even breathe. And they tested him for everything but HIV. Like literally you're sick as all outdoors and they test you for cancer, diabetes, you name it. But everything but but HIV. They take a ten dollar HIV test and boom, here we go with the diagnosis. So that type of stigma exists even in the medical profession. Also, personal stigma when it comes to taking HIV tests. If people feel like if I say I need the HIV test and I'm kind of like passively admitting that I've done something wrong, horrible, and disgusting. So like taking the HIV test is very stigmatizing. And the only way that you know that you have HIV is having a test. Um, the other the other portion of that is the um, religious aspect. There's a lot of toxic religion that goes around 
in the South, particularly since most people who are living with HIV are same gender loving men. So like the Bible, according to what they say, said that, you know, just because you're gay, you don't, you're not even worthy of, of help or life or anything. And that's just not, that's apparently not true. There are a lot of passages in the Bible that will tell you that that's pretty much bullshit. Um, and lastly, uh, the institutional racism. Like literally we, when Vanessa mentioned how the, the, the South was kind of like uh, left out of the HIV prevention when it first started. Well, you know, the systems that have been created right now have not been created for people who have mostly lived with HIV. And in the South, it's mostly Black people. So like Black people having to navigate systems that were not designed or built for them. And it causes a lot of people to fall out of care. It causes people not to engage in care. And it causes people not to be able to make their appointments. Uh, so like there are a lot of things that we can do to rectify that. Um, and the other thing is like most of the people who need to be at the table making decisions, we're not there. So that, that's my take. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. Did anyone else have anything they wanted to share about unique challenges in the South or why in the South we have such high rates of HIV? I think Vanessa and Tony gave us great coverage, but I want to open the floor for anyone else. I kind of want to add one last thing, and mm -hmm. it's the, the NIMBY aspect of it. We have a lot of community leaders, religious leaders, um, elected officials, things like that, who when we start talking about HIV and prevention and all of that, despite evidence to the contrary, they want to sit there and say, oh, well, that doesn't happen here. You know, yeah. we don't have that problem here. Yeah. And you have to kind of take back and say like, sir, I'm looking at the numbers. Right. It is absolutely happening here. Yeah. Um, and we still have to fight that. And it's it's a combination, kind of the 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 end result of everything that they've mentioned, the the ignoring HIV at the beginning, the racism, the all of the other factors um that all play into this, you know, kind of attitude of I don't see it, so it's not a problem. Right. Um, and that's that's what we fight day in and day out. When we go into a lot of our rural areas, you know, we cover 12 counties at AIDS Alabama South. Um, 11 of those are considered rural areas. And so many of these spaces we go into um, where we try and set up and do outreach or clinical services or anything, we run into, oh, well, y'all don't need to come here. We don't have that. Yeah. Um, and it's what we still have to fight. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I know that we re we um, encounter the same issues with sex ed. It's like, you know, you are trying to get a sex ed implementation started up at a school or in a community, and the leaders are all like, oh, that's not a problem here. <laughs> you know, we have a problem with drugs, or we have a problem with, um, a lot of times they'll, they'll talk about drugs. Um, I'm I can't think of another one off the top of my head, but, you know, it's like, well, if you have a problem with young people using drugs, they probably are also engaging in sexual behaviors as well. <laughs> I was about to say, um, those are all interconnected. <laughs> yeah, so it's really uh, sticking our head down in the sand um, approach, and that's unfortunate. So thanks for sharing that. Okay, um, so I'm going to pass this back over to Tony. I know you're just talking about stigma, and so I'm kind of going to ask you uh, another question related to that, but tell us why HIV testing is so important for everyone, not just quote-unquote at-risk communities. Well, first, I hate saying at risk, like people don't want to be considered vectors for disease. So like just that terminology is harmful in itself. And it's not I, literally that's what people say. Uh, I like to say people with high indicators for acquiring HIV. It's a lot more words. But I mean, like saying that a particular group of people are at risk says that other people are not. HIV does not discriminate unlike people. So like it doesn't matter, you know, how you identify who you are. HIV doesn't care. Uh, and even when we talk about uh, risk factors, like there are people who like, even with the advent of PrEP, which you might talk about later, like even when PrEP came out, the, the, the uh, protocols for prescribing PrEP was for people who had multiple sex partners, which is sex shaming. And it's like getting pregnant. It just takes one time. Like I cannot tell you the number of people who, I'm, I'm in a lot of different groups uh, online, when people talk about, well, if I could go back and tell my younger self one thing, what would it be? And one of the most poignant answers that I got was keeping my body count low would not save me. Because people think that if I just have sex with this one person, 
then I'm pretty much safe from HIV. You are not. <laughs> yeah. You are not. Uh, and not, you know, trying to cast aspersions on people's partners, but you only know what those people are doing when they're with you. And, you know, it's so like there's a there's a lot to go into that whole stigmatizing thing about being tested. Uh, when I was working in HIV full time, you know, we would have testing events and like you're like, hey, we're doing HIV test. Want to get one? No, I, I don't need one. And I, in the back of my mind, like, are you having sex? <laughs> because if you're having sex, you need to have one. Um, and a lot of people don't really even understand that, uh, especially my, 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 my friends who are, who were born with vaginas, like literally, you know, cisgender women, um, you know, you may go to the, to the doctor for your annual checkup and women are way better than taking care of themselves medically than men are. And like you have a complete blood workup, but unless you specifically say you want to have an HIV test, they haven't tested you. Uh, and that's the, that's, that's the ugly side of stigma when it comes to like just, just medical care. Yeah. I mean, and I've even heard it kind of in a, a reverse way of like, if you look, look a certain way and you have a certain job and, you know, you may not be tested versus someone who looks a different way. And, you know, of course I am talking about racism here that, you know, then we're going to test the woman, the woman of color versus the white woman and that all the, I mean, so many you know, ripple effects there. You know, the, the, the thing about that is like, literally like, there, and then there's a lot of boogeymen people create. Like I hate the term DL men. Like most women who con who contract HIV don't contract it from men who are having sex with men who are bisexual. Like they literally co uh, contract it from their straight counterparts who are probably having sex with sex workers who are doing IV drugs. And we mentioned drugs earlier. Like you said, drugs can be a problem even when it comes to HIV. The three guys that I mentioned to you earlier, like two of them were older white men. One of them was a preacher and the other one was a straight presenting young black man. Nobody's going to ask these guys, you know, if you want to get an HIV test because they don't pretty much fit the, the stereotypical bill right. for it. The stereotype, right. Absolutely. Did anybody else want to add anything about that? Um, I know uh, in our line of work in sex education, we're moving away from that quote unquote at risk language. And I wrote down what you said, high indicators for acquiring HIV. I like that. Um, it, did anybody else have anything they want to add about that kind of terminology or anything about the stigma there? I think uh, number one, uh, Tony, you made some excellent points. And so to um, speak to that, I think that when you focus on at-risk communities, that that really uh, perpetuates that stigma and it perpetuates discrimination. And when we um, re-shift the focus to people who are sexually active, especially when you are talking in terms of a disease where, um, like most diseases where early detection and early treatment are the key, um, I think that more people are going to benefit from that. I think that when you uh, keep that focus on, well, this is only something that happens in this community, or this is only something that happens here, that there is a lot of um, othering that's behind that. A lot of um, just really pathologizing the virus and, and just demonizing it and demonizing folks who may acquire it. Um, I had another point. It was really good. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> But it was it was in agreement with everything that that Tony said, and I think that yeah, just to to stress that we need to um, focus on um, people who are sexually active, and I think that that's more of um, increases the likelihood that you're going to detect early, like the um, person that he was mentioning that um, the the virus was so advanced that he probably had an AIDS diagnosis, and you know could that have been caught earlier um, and led to a better outcome. Yeah. And maybe you'll think of your point again, um, but you, what you just said reminded me, um, you know, a lot of times in sex education work, we talk about, um, you know, we say sexually active and for young people, like, what does that even mean? And so Brittany knows this, like oral, anal, vaginal sex. Those are like oral, anal, vag you know, we say that all the time when we're teaching our curriculum or talking with young people, um, because a lot of young people think, well, oh, well, um, oral sex, which I do know oral sex has a much lower incident rate for HIV, but of course anal sex has a much higher. And so um, a lot of young people think, well, I'm not having, you know, penis and vagina sex, um, so I'm safe. And that's just not the case. Um, and so, uh, you know, just reiterating what those be explicit behaviors are that can lead to an HIV um, 
a positive HIV test. Hey, Christina, to, to Lori's point, to Lori's point, like all of those men had CD4 counts under 10, like well into an AIDS diagnosis. Wow, yeah. And my, I remembered my point while you were talking um, that when you can, when you continue to other folks and you continue to perpetuate those stereotypes, that negatively impacts people's perception of risk. So not only, and that is for individuals, and that's also for providers. So, um, right. like again, like Tony was saying, when these uh, people are coming through, they're having symptoms that are consistent with, you know, HIV infection, what have you. And providers aren't; their minds aren't going there because right. they're thinking this person doesn't fit the at-risk, you know, mold that I'm thinking of. So it's going to negatively impact um, the perception of risk for providers and also for individuals and that's going to um, discourage them from seeking testing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great points. I want to uh, chime no. in one last thing on oh, that. Of course, um, of course. I go even a, a step further than just, you know, for people who are sexually active, you know, I'll take it if you haven't had an HIV test since the last time you had sex, even if you're now abstinent, um, because that can be a big thing. You may have been abstinent for the last five years, but if you haven't been tested since then, then you probably still need to be tested. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very rarely do you encounter somebody who has just been celibate their entire life. Um, you know, you, you, everybody's had some sort of at-risk behavior. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, so Chance, keep your mic on because my next question is for you. So we're talking a lot about HIV testing. Um, I So what is the HIV testing process like at AIDS Alabama or maybe specifically at your clinic? What does that look like? Someone comes in, they need an HIV test. What is that process? So for us, we have kind of streamlined ours a little bit. When you come to our agency, um, <coughs> You ring the back doorbell, you let them know you're here for an HIV test. Um, they're going to direct you where to go, and they'll let you know to come into our lobby and check in on the kiosk. Um, now, that kiosk has will collect every bit of information that we need to know in order to test you. Um, your demographic information, your, um, your risk factors, all of that type of stuff. Um, and it takes about five minutes to complete, but we found that for a lot of people, um, the kiosk works better than handing them a paper form to fill out because they can't skip questions. Mm -hmm. And then it also works better than for some people than having someone ask them those questions because they get a little bit of an anonymity in responding. Yeah. Um, you don't have someone looking at you across the table asking you if you've had multiple sex partners or if you've used injection drugs, you're answering on a screen that no one else can see. Um, right. So we've seen a bit more, I, I guess, openness in that. But okay. from there, once they submit the, their check-in on the kiosk, it goes to one of our testing coordinators. Um, they'll print that form out, they'll examine it, and then they'll pull you back to our testing room. Um, it functions almost the same way like you, you'd you um, check in at a doctor's office and they'll pull you back to the back. Um, from there, they'll sit you down. They'll explain the type of test that we're doing today. You know, typically it's our INSTI test, which is a finger stick and gives results in about 60 seconds. Okay. Um, they'll also talk with you about your risk factors, um, the things that you may or may not be engaging in, um, how you can... Um, lower those risk factors if you're interested in that. Okay. Um, and then they're also going to talk to you about um, PrEP, if it looks like you're a good candidate for PrEP um, while they're doing that test. Um, and this all takes place pretty quick. You know, most people are only back with our testing coordinator about five to seven minutes. Um, then from there, once that test has developed, they'll give you a little results card that says your first initial, your last name, that you got tested, what your results were, um, when we recommend that you should come back for testing, um, and then a, a signature on it. And from there, 
depending on how our conversation went. Um, if we talked to you about prep and you wanted to get more information, we'll take you over to our clinic side and let you talk to one of the providers about that. Um, if you wanted STI testing, we'll send you to the restroom to provide a, a urine sample, or if that's all you wanted today, um, we'll send you on your way and you can have a great afternoon. Yeah. Um, I wasn't aware that they had um, testing that came back so quickly now. So 60 seconds is, I mean, that's great. <laughs> uh, having to wait one minute for that kind of a result is, is wonderful. It absolutely is. And it definitely lowers the anxiety for a lot of people in it, you know, when they find out that, you know, oh, it's only 60 seconds. You know, right. a lot of times I'll have a result before I'm fully finished explaining the test to them. Right. Um, and I can remember myself the first time I ever got tested, I had to go to the health department and wait like three weeks for a result. Um, yeah. And that three weeks was nauseating. Yeah. Um, and then it got a little bit better and, you know, it was only three or four days. And then the next time, you know, actually when I started coming to AIDS Alabama South to get tested, it was about 20 minutes to get tested then. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of years ago, they came out with the, this new test that gives us results in, in 60 seconds. And I mean, you, you almost don't have time to get nervous about it. Yeah, that's great though. I mean, it's so amazing the way, you know, medical advances have been made that we have this kind of science that can, um, can do that. Uh, you mentioned prep a couple of times. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass this to Lori, but anybody can talk about this or answer. Um, what is prep just for anyone who doesn't know, and how can it be utilized to promote sexual health for all people? Um, you know, kind of getting away from that stigma of certain people need, might need it, you know, how can it be utilized in that way? Yeah, PrEP is HIV medication that is taken for the purposes of preventing HIV. So it's taken by people who do, do not have HIV to prevent them from getting HIV. Um, generally, it is prescribed as one pill per day. Um, it can be taken, um, I think it's called like on-demand dosing to where you're not on a prep regimen every single day. Um, it, and, you know, that may be uh, ideal for some folks. It just depends if it's a case-by-case -case thing. Um, in addition, I know that they have recently approved um, injectables for PrEP. And so the injectables, uh, it's, that's a, I can fall down a rabbit hole with that, but there's really good um, rates of uh, people, I guess, staying HIV negative with the injectables because you have to get it at a certain time and it has to be, you know, certain dosing so that the, um, I guess, margin for error is a little bit lower than it would be if, if someone was taking like one pill a day. So um, that's what it is. It is HIV meds to prevent folks from getting HIV. Um, in terms of promoting sexual health for all people, it provides a really effective and efficacious safeguard um, for people who may not always use condoms or people who don't want to use condoms or whatever the case is. So we're removing that judgment and that morality piece from you don't always use condoms or barriers or whatever. So it really um, allows people to have more of a I guess control over um, over their sexual health because you know that you are preventing um, HIV and you know if you're on the medication we know that it works we know that it is a very effective um, measure for prevention. In addition, there are some um, I guess you would say like uh, follow up care or there's associated care involved with being on prep and what that may look like is. Uh, if someone's on it, they do get um, routine HIV testing. I believe it's every three months, routine HIV testing and also um, routine STI testing. So in the event that someone does acquire an STI while they are on PrEP, then they are getting that treatment um, because they are, you know, it, it's holding them to a certain level of increasing their accountability that they're, they're getting that routine testing. In addition, just like we see with, um, I guess harm reduction uh, programs or like syringe uh, service programs, things like that. I noticed a lot of parallels because folks, um, they are interacting with someone. They're interacting with a provider. They're talking to someone. So there's that uh, health education and HIV counseling piece that also accompanies it that really reinforces uh, that whole process of, of them being on PrEP and their reasons for it and all of those things. Um, and so another thing too, even if a person, uh, uses condoms 
perfectly and each and every time they have sex and all of those things, we know that at the end of the day, condoms um, reduce risk, but they do not eliminate risk. So condoms aren't 100%, just like your seat belts aren't 100% effective, just like your masks aren't 100% effective. Um, so if you are using uh, something that reduces risk, that is good. But again, if you do not use it or you're not using them every time or, you know, it's not perfect, it's imperfect use or, you know, whatever, then it's going to provide that, um, that safety net uh, to, to help you prevent HIV. Okay. Great. Um, thanks for sharing about that. Um, I just have like a follow-up question. I didn't have this written down, but you talked about condoms. Um, and of course, you know, in sex ed, we're always talking about condoms. Is condoms still like the holy grail? Is that kind of what we're always talking about when we're count doing, when y'all are doing counseling or, you know, talking with folks? Is it condoms as like the first line of defense still? Um, I know it is in our work, but I just was curious and kind of more the HIV world. Okay, so I'm the uh, keep it real person on this on the panel. Nobody's <laughs> using condoms. Like if condoms were being used, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're using. So although I know Alabama is an abstinence only condom second type state, which most of these southeast states are, nobody's using them. Like if they were using them, we would not have condoms still work. Like even with one of the people I talked about earlier, he was actually married to a woman and we tested her and she was negative. And like we were shocked. We we're like, oh, wait a minute, hold on. He got a serious AIDS diagnosis and his wife is negative. Like, how does that happen? And uh, she literally said, well, you know, we use condoms as a form of birth control. Okay. <laughs> and so when she said that, I'm like, okay, like literally their oldest child was like 15. And anytime they would have sex, they use condoms. Condoms work. I yeah. mean, they're only, they're all, like, like Lori said, they're only 75, 70 to 90% effective because condoms break, uh, dry condoms break, old condoms break, right. you know, damaged condoms break. But like literally they still work, but nobody's using them. If they were being used, we would not be having this conversation. So like, you know, prep is a great follow-up for, for condoms, but like no, nobody's using them. <laughs> like. It is what it well, is. I appreciate you being frank. Um, I know the stats um, as of the most recent YRBS, which is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey done by the CDC in Alabama, high school students who are engaging in sexual behaviors, I think it's like just over 50% are using condoms. So it's still and that's probably I mean, a lie. They and that's a lot that's that. gone up, but that's still so low, obviously. I, I just want to share, I mean, to kind of build on what Tony said, even when people are using condoms, they're not necessarily using them in a way that will prevent HIV and especially other STIs. Okay. Um, one thing we know, um, if someone has syphilis or herpes, um, a condom may not necessarily protect you from those because it's only covering a certain area and that area may not be where the those sores that transmit those are. Um, right. Same thing, unless you're using condoms with oral as well, you may still transmit things like chlamydia or gonorrhea to your partner orally. Um, they may end up with a, an oral infection, and then from there, they may spread it to, to someone else when they have oral with them. So I can't imagine anyone's using condoms for oral sex. I mean, that, just I mean, seems, that seems not... Even Not the good. best flavors <laughs> like, it doesn't are seem still appetizing, right? <laughs> no, e even the best flavored it. condoms are still banana flavored rubber. <clears throat> right, um, exactly, exactly. Right, which is exactly what like a dental dam, and you know, we talk about dental dams, which is right. used for oral sex, but it's kind of hard. You know, I'm not even sure where you find those at. You know, I don't know. Uh, we, we give them out here, but I mean. Who wants to put a dental napkin over? It's it? not sexy. It's just it's not, not sexy. It's not. Yeah. I'm ready. Are condoms still the do we stress condom use? Yes, we stress condom use, but I try to really disentangle, like I mentioned, that um, you know, assigning any kind of morality or any shaming for anyone who doesn't use them. I mean, I just stress that they're here, we have them. If you, you know, we encourage you to use them, prep protects against HIV transmission, it does not protect against other STIs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in terms of preventing HIV, and is that still the holy grail? I'd also like to mention TASP, 
and now it's a concept that it's called, uh, that is another acronym, uh, but it's treatment as prevention. And so if someone is living with HIV and they are receiving um, the proper medical care and they are virally suppressed for greater than six months, that's called sustained viral suppression, they mm -hmm. cannot transmit HIV to sexual partners. Um, so that's the goal of, of HIV treatment. It's going to prolong that person's life and it's going to prevent um, new HIV transmissions. And so it's um, for them to be virally suppressed or undetectable. Many people can achieve an undetectable viral load. So that's another um, method. Because when we talk about HIV prevention, people are like comics. Like, yeah. well, you know, also PrEP, also TASP. Also, early, you know, routine testing. Also, et cetera, et cetera. So, I did want to mention that as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, go ahead, go ahead, Chance. I, I was just gonna say I want to build on what I said and what Lori said too. You know, with that, it, even with my thoughts on condoms not necessarily preventing other STIs, it does. Like she was mentioning, it puts us to push a very holistic approach to um, prevention. As you want to use this as part of, you know, talk about PrEP, talk about condom use, talk about having open and honest conversations with your partners about what type of things that you're doing and who you're doing them with. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to have all of these different things combined to give you the best ways to protect yourself. Um, and then from there also, I always like to make the, the just simple analogy that PrEP is for HIV, like birth control is for pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most people, you know, they, they know what birth control is. They know how it works. They know, you know, you take it every day, even when you're not having sex. That way you're ready when you are. Mm -hmm. um, and it also gives us a great analogy from there for PEP as well, post-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. Because if PrEP is like birth control, PEP is like plan B. Yeah. You know, and it, it functions those same paramounts, you know, you want to take it within 72 hours after, you know, you want to make sure your adherence and taking all of your doses, that type of thing. And it gives something that everyone can relate to and kind of compare them with. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing that chance. Tony, what's up? I'm going to get real nerdy for a second. So, like, we talked about, like, uh, HIV diagnosis. We talked about AIDS. Like, AIDS is a diagnosis. It's not a disease. So, the technical, def the technical definition for AIDS is someone having a CD4 count of less than 200 plus an opportunistic infection. An opportunistic infection is some weird disease that you get because you have advanced HIV, right? So, that's right. an AIDS diagnosis. We have gone to this model that, I'm going to just be honest, I hate. So, this whole U equals U nonsense. So, mm -hmm. Undetectability is a moving target. So like undetectable, when you're undetectable with HIV, that means you have a viral load of less than 200, right? Mm -hmm. But when we talk about undetectability now, it's having a viral load for, of under 20. So when we say U equals U, undetectable means untransmissible, mm -hmm. then you're kind of like creating a false narrative because I can have a detectable viral load and still not be transmissible. Because okay. anything under 200 and over 20 can be detectable. So okay. from 21 to 199, to 21 on up, you're detectable. So like people who go to the doctor, like I had some people who like really like were beating themselves up. Maybe they missed the dose or maybe they had like a flu or something and it caused their immune system to be compromised even more and their viral load became detectable. I'm like, oh my God, I think I gave my partner HIV. No. Okay. As long as your viral load does not go over 200, you are still virally suppressed. So it shouldn't be undetectable equals untransmissible. It should be virally suppressed. And that ain't, you can't do a cute acronym with V right. equals you. <laughs> and, like, and, and that's the thing I hate about where we are right now. We want things to be cute and pleasing to the ear. And V equals you does not sound as good as you equals you. <laughs> but you equals you is a lot. Like you equals you is a, is a lot. And I think yeah. people are who don't really like I'm a nerd. I know I'm a nerd. So like if you don't understand that, then you're running around here thinking like you're transmitting HIV to people if you are living with HIV and you're not undetectable according to what the guideline is. And I think we need to re-educate people about 
what vowel suppression really means. Because if not, you have a lot of people who may get hurt because yeah. they may have somebody never, their, their vowel low went from being undetectable to detectable under 200. And you got somebody mad at them thinking that they contracted HIV for them. So like, right. I really wish we would just like stick to the facts. HIV can be sexy. It can be cute, but it ain't <laughs> always got to be. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm learning so much here. I mean, and I work in, um, I don't work in the HIV space, but like I work right next to it, you know, in sex ed. And so like, I'm talking about HIV and the work that I'm doing, but I am still learning so much from y'all. So thank you so much for this wealth of knowledge. Um, Brittany, I want to talk to you because we talked a lot about all the advances that have been made in sex, or I'm sorry, in HIV treatment and um, things that probably the common person doesn't even know about. Um, but what I've heard is that young people are not as afraid to get HIV anymore. Like there used to be this huge fear around young people getting HIV uh, or about, you know, getting HIV period. It was a death sentence type of thing. Um, but now I've heard from kind of um, out and about that they're not as afraid of that anymore because they know that there's treatments for it. So maybe they've become more relaxed on, you know, protecting their sexual health. What is your read on that? Like, is that something you're actually seeing in the work that you're doing? Um, and what's your response to that? <clears throat> yeah, I think with advances um, in prevention, things like PrEP, um, what's happening with, especially, and I can speak directly for like adolescents, young adults, what's happening is that um, we're not doing a good job at educating exactly what PrEP is. So they're thinking that PrEP is, you know, preventing all STDs. And so I think it's very important is as we're, you know, administering PrEP, especially to young adults, adolescents, it is, education is very important. And not just with, you know, PrEP, I can actually go back to, you know, the first topic or the first question, um, you know, where we talked about some of the issues with HIV in the South. And it is, you know, we can always go back to comprehensive education. We can always go back to, um, you know, we live in the Bible Belt and, you know, there's a focus on abstinence. Um, but just from my experience with youth and working with adolescents directly, um, education is still needed. Um, you know, I went to, I spoke at a conference earlier this year and, you know, I thought it would be just kind of, you know, a quick overview of HIV. I wanted to touch on the, you know, in the HIV epidemic and some of the work we're doing in Alabama that turned into a whole HIV 101 presentation. You guys will be surprised as to how many youth, young adults don't know the basic HIV transmission. I mean, body fluids, like, and so, you know, I just feel like, you know, education is definitely important. And, you know, with youth and young adults, especially adolescents, um, you know, with, and talking about PrEP, you know, there is not easy, easily accessible to them as, you know, for, you know, adult populations. But, you know, once we are educating and administering PrEP, just making sure that we're educating and exactly what it is and making sure they know that you still need to use condoms and other forms of protection because this this medication is strictly to prevent HIV and, and that's it. And so we see where they are, you know, kind of, like you said, lax and engaging in more risky behaviors because they feel like, you know, well, you know, I can't catch it. So um, I just feel like education is very important, um, you know, whether it's educating on prevention or just comprehensive, but education is very important. And I've seen it, especially with our youth population. We always kind of forget about them, but, you know, that's kind of my, you know, group to work with and just making sure we're educating. Yeah. And yeah. I think this was the same one, possibly, this is the same one I was at. And I was in those sessions too. And we were like giving away Starbucks gift cards because we just wanted them to say the, the body fluids that are, pat and they were like so squeamish about just saying the words. Right. Um, and it was oral sex, it was anal sex. Like, like it's right. Still high school, we're giggling mm -hmm. when we hear the word sex or oral sex. Like it shouldn't be that, you know, for high school, you know, young adults. So yeah. Yeah. And I would also say like, that conference we were at was definitely um, a section of the school population that is probably a little bit more privileged, more white. And so they probably aren't because their adults in their life are like, oh, well, they don't need that because again, they're not the ones, you know, they're not the at risk. Yeah, exactly. That need that information when anybody can get HIV. Um, yeah, that's true. And I've actually done like outreach and set up tables with, you know, information. And I've had you know youth and kids wanting to walk over to the table to grab information their parents 
stopped them and said, you don't need this information. I'm like, you don't know what your child is doing. Right. And even if they're not, at some point, they're going to need to know how to prevent, you know, or just, you know, in general. So it was just, it's, it's, it's interesting the amount of parents um, who feel, who still feel like, you know, educating a comprehensive sex ed will somehow, I guess, make their kid, you know, want to have sex. And we know that that's not, that's not the case at all. Absolutely. So I was going to say that I see this on a firsthand basis. I have an eighth grader um, and perhaps I will give a little bit of credit maybe to COVID uh, as part of part of the issue, but he has not received any sex ed or any um, any kind of information about HIV. And I will mention that uh, there is a state law that requires um, the the teaching of HIV prevention in grades fifth through twelfth. But like I said, he's in eighth grade and has never gotten it. Um, so there's there's definitely an education gap um, with both both students and and youth and parents. Um, I think you know Brittany is absolutely correct that there's a stigma associated with sex ed that teaching kids about sex education is going to then make them go out and want to have sex. Where you know study after study shows that having being armed with that information just actually makes people less likely to go out and have sex, or if they are going to be having sex, making educated, wise decisions on how best to protect themselves. So I absolutely think that there, there is an education gap. And, you know, from my perspective, policy is not going to, uh, to fill that gap. It really comes down to, to parents, to schools, and ensuring that that information and it's taught in, in the school systems or at home. Um, because if the school isn't going to do it, home has to do it. You know, we we do outreach events all the time. And I've definitely experienced what Brittany was talking about, where the parent uh, keeps the kid from walking up to the table, um, where that would have been a really beautiful teaching moment um, to interact with a youth and have them hear that information from a reputable source that does know what they're talking about, rather than some secondhand information that they might be getting from friends or from, you know, other other sources. Online. Yeah, on, exactly. <laughs> Um, so having that trusted trusted source is also really Im an important part of the, that education component because, you know, just because you found information about STIs online does not mean that you actually, you know, know how to um, have safe sex relations or, uh, or prevent um, any kind of sexually transmitted infection. Christina, can I go back to the original question about the, the advancements of HIV and how they kind of have, have hurt the prevention? efforts like I've taught the young people and like back when I was that I was diagnosed in 1993 literally all of my friends were dying uh, -huh. uh and so like there was this sense of okay I need to protect myself whether we chose to or not which I did you know there was this thing like okay if you do this then you might get this and I think because now the 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 thing is well if I get HIV all I gotta do is take a pill and like when we talk about stigma like when stigma shows up with actual HIV treatment, it can show up in a way of, oh my God, every time I take this pill, I'm reminded I have this dreaded disease. Mm -hmm. So they don't take the pills. So like having the pills and taking them is, is two different things. They're not synonymous. You can have the pills and not take them. I've known people who have died from HIV complications in the last nine years. And like this one guy literally had a box of HIV meds that he just didn't take. Yeah. And, you know, and it may have been because he felt bad about taking them. It could be that you live in a place where you don't feel safe to bring your mess in the house. Yeah. So, like, saying it only takes a pill is one thing, but you got to take that pill. One other note, my, my pastor, he was a, he was uh, doing this youth uh, um, uh, group in one summer, and he came up to about, he came up to this uh, other counselor and like, hey, you know, there's a pill that people can take to um, prevent HIV. The counselor replied to him, oh my God, that's terrible. What are we going to do to scare them into not having sex now? Like, we're not trying to scare people into not having sex. Yeah. We want them to be educated on how they have sex. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's like a shift for maybe some older, old school folks that, um, you know, are coming for, at sex education from like having done it for decades and decades is like, 
there is still that scare tactic. And that's certainly the tactic that, um, you know, schools and parents probably want us to, by and large, would want us to use. And we're moving like forward, like we're moving into, you know, actually sex can be pleasurable and it's very holistic and, and, you know, here's how you protect yourself. But sex is also all these other things. It's not just prevention of pregnancy and STIs and HIV. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm of the, I have the same mind. Like we're not trying to scare them not to have sex. Um, okay, so we're getting down to time, but I just wanna ask, this is a question for anyone. Do you think that there are tools in this fight against HIV that we are not utilizing or not? I know we've talked about some things today that maybe we're not utilizing enough. <clears throat> Okay, um, go. So go ahead. Our, um, yeah, I was, I was gonna say <laughs> what me and Tony said earlier <laughs> was basically just, just shifting the narrative away from at risk groups to casting a wider net for people who, and to Chance's point, if you timely testing, routine testing if you're sexually active, um, and just you know, it, 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 shifting that narrative. It's not just people, it's not just certain kinds of people. So in doing that, we are going to um, just really work to break down that stigma of that perpetuating, this is the only kind of people that can get HIV, this and that. And we're also going to um, positively influence people's uh, perception of risk and hopefully encourage testing and encourage um, the encouragement of testing by providers. Yes. Awesome. I was gonna say all of them. Like we're not using everything to the best of the ability that we can. And like the thing that sticks out to me most is prep. Uh, like when I was in HIV full time, I remember hearing people going to all these conferences talking about how you know like black gay men in the south are not using prep at the same rates of our counterparts, and they list all the ills of the south that contribute to that: the racism, the poverty, the lack of Medicaid expansion all these other things, including stigma, but they also fail to address the fact that sometimes it's just not convenient. So in 2019, I created a prep clinic that chanced them copy, and we did after hours prep. Like you may have a job where you have insurance and you just may not be able to leave at two o'clock to go to a two, a two hour appointment and get back. So we created a prep clinic where we had clinic on Tuesday nights from six to nine, and on Saturdays from 10 to three. So like, even if you have a job, even if you have insurance, sometimes it's just not convenient. We need to get out of the mindset of making things convenient for us as providers and make it convenient for the patients instead. But ask somebody to do something after five o'clock, it's a wrap. Yeah, yeah. It's the same with serving young people, right? Like they're in school until usually three, maybe four, if they have after school activities and like, how do we get them the care that they might need in those after hour times, um, so it's the same thing. And, you know, to, to Tony's point on that, you know, we've kept up with that having after hours, you know, hours um, on Tuesdays so that we do have that. And then taking it a step further with, we will take our, we've got a clinical RV out into the community and provide like um, Thursday for World AIDS Day. We were at a local bar until almost midnight um, offering prep services and testing and things like that um, out in the parking lot. Yeah. Um, and it was just, you know, people walk up, hey, what are y'all doing? You know, this is what we've got. This is what, you know, we're offering. And we apply a lot of this stuff we've talked about, and, you know, oh, well, I don't think I need to get tested. Well, have you been sexually active? Right. You know, right. No, I haven't been in years. Well, have you gotten tested since you were? Right. No. Well, you should probably get tested. Maybe think no. about that. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And we got we got a lot of people that were like, yeah, well, you know what? I will. No, and then, okay. you know, for some of them, that final thing was, you know, well, if you get tested, we've got a goodie bag. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Whatever incentive, know. especially if they think that they're negative, like then it's kind of like, well, you know, then I get, at least I just get this goodie bag, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe they don't have all that fear and shame wrapped up in it. Um, that's awesome. It's like kind of meeting people where they are. I appreciate that. Does anybody want to, else want to add anything about tools that we might not be utilizing or utilizing well in this fight? One more thing. I just think we need to, like Lori said, we need to change the narrative about who contracts HIV. Right now, Black women are the second highest group when it comes to acquisition of new HIV uh, cases, and no one is really talking to them effectively about 
of what their risks are. Again, mm -hmm. the myth is that I'm dating a guy who may be bisexual or just, you know, has me as a beard or whatever. And that's not the case. So, like, if you are a woman, whether cis or trans, like, get an HIV test. Go test with your partner. But, like, don't, like we're not, we need to really reimagine the way that we're doing HIV in the South because, honestly, what we're doing right now, it ain't working. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we are about at time. Um, I would ask if we have any comments from our listeners, if they want to drop in the chat, any comments, I'm going to drop in our, um, our evaluation. If you, uh, that our, our participants would please fill that out. It would take a couple minutes. Um, it really helps us kind of shape what we're going to be doing next year and lets us know if this is, you know, valuable, useful information for you. But honestly, this was so um, educational for me as someone who works in sex education that I can't imagine that um, it's not going to be just valuable for everyone else as well. Um, and Tony dropped in um, the work that he did. Was that last year that they, or the year before? Last last year, CNN and Gilead sponsored a series of a doc, mini documentaries on six different people who were doing HIV work in South. I was one of them. Yeah. Uh, but there are some actually people doing some really amazing work uh, in the South uh, on HIV. And all six videos are up now. So I would encourage you to check them out. Yeah, and there are many documentaries. I can tell you they're very moving. Um, they're wonderfully done as well. So please check those out and free to view as well. Um, all right, so I guess that's about it. Thank you all so much. And uh, again, the... the um, sorry, the evaluations in the chat. So uh, I'll just stay on for another minute. Thank you all. <clears throat> I'm trying to copy the evaluation link. Oh, there we go. All right. That's cool. I'm going to stay on for another minute. So anyone, hopefully you can just click it. Um, but yeah. All right. I got it. I'm out. See you later, Chris. All right. Bye, Tony. Bye. Thanks so much. Anytime.